Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks and this week in honour of its 60th birthday we're taking a closer look at the Epiphone Casino. <laughs> with the release of Peter Jackson's documentary Get Back, there's been a renewed interest not only in the Beatles, but their gear. And one guitar that was particularly prevalent for near enough the eight hours of the documentary is John Lennon's Epiphone Casino. Now, of course, the Epiphone brand is today well known, primarily as a brand that focuses on budget-friendly versions of classic Gibson guitars. But what's not so well known is that the Epiphone brand actually precedes Gibson by some 30 years, and that for decades they were actually fierce competitors each being the other's main rival. Now, the two neck and neck throughout the 30s, World War II saw a severe downturn in Epiphone's fortunes, culminating in then Gibson president Ted McCarty authorising Gibson's purchase of Epiphone in 1957 for just $20,000. Now, the initial plan was to incorporate Epiphone's prestigious upright bass line into Gibson's own catalogue, but the company soon changed their mind. Gibson-made Epiphone guitars were offered to dealers that were keen to secure a Gibson contract, but in the eyes of the company had not yet proven themselves worthy or profitable enough, ultimately. For many, this was seen as the perfect solution. Gibson made quality products at a lower price point, offered to dealers without stepping on the toes of existing Gibson outlets. Now, as well as more budget-friendly versions of classic Gibson guitars, the merger also saw the reissue of classic Epiphone designs, such as the Triumph, the Emperor, and the Deluxe, as well as several new designs, including the Sheraton and, in 1961, the Casino. Now, despite the early 1960s being an incredibly profitable period for Epiphone, the first few years of the casino's production passed relatively without note. That is, until late 1964, when one Paul McCartney walked into a guitar shop on Charing Cross Road in London, specifically looking for a guitar that would help replicate the type of feedback that he'd heard one Jimi Hendrix produce. Now, if you've ever played a casino, you will know that feedback is never far away, thanks to its entirely hollow body construction. Now, in regard to its construction, it pretty much is a Gibson ES330. Entirely hollow body construction, two P90s, and a neck that joins the body at the 15th fret, as opposed to the 19th fret, as you might expect with an ES335. According to Gibson's records, Paul McCartney's casino left Kalamazoo, Michigan on November 1st, 1962, and thereafter was used by the Beatle extensively in the studio. Tracks like Paperback Writer, Ticket to Ride, Taxman, Drive My Car, The End, and of course a song that is considered by many as being the genesis of heavy metal, Helter Skelter. When I get to the bottom, I go back to the top of the slide. Oh, stop and I turn and I go for a ride. Needless to say, it wasn't long until both John Lennon and George Harrison followed suit, both buying a sunburst 1965 casino in the spring of 1966 during the Revolver Sessions. At quick glance, they were incredibly similar to Paul McCartney's earlier models, save for the new updated hourglass headstock shape that Epiphone had introduced in 1963. 
Much like Paul's, George had a Bigsby vibrato, whereas John's had the new standard Epiphone trapeze tailpiece. The first public outing of the guitars was a mind performance of Rain and Paperback Writer on top of the Pops in 1966, and the two Beatles used these guitars near enough exclusively on their incredibly hectic touring schedule of the same year, visiting Japan, Germany, the Philippines and the US. All three casinos were present and correct during the Sgt. Pepper recording sessions. However, it wasn't to be until 1968 that the two casinos would take on their most identifiable form. After the Beatles' visit to Rishi Kesh to study Transcendental Meditation with the Maharishi, after folk singer Donovan convinced George and John that their two casinos would sound infinitely better, relieved of their heavy finish. Upon returning to the UK, both guitars were stripped of their nitrocellulose down to their bare woods, and it's in this state that John's in particular is most identifiable. Used, of course, throughout the promo for the White Album and on the White Album itself, used on his performance at the Rock and Roll Circus with the Stones, and most famously on the Let It Be sessions and the culminating rooftop concert. <laughs> Despite the Beatles' devotion to the Epiphone Casino, it wasn't to have quite the same marked impact on the company that their earlier guitar choice did for Rickenbacker. And, and by 1970, thanks to dwindling sales and more widespread financial issues, Epiphone ceased production of the casino entirely. And it wasn't to be some 24 years later, in 1994, that they finally reissued the casino. One early adopter, of course, being Beatles devotee, Noel Gallagher. In more recent years, there have been any number of Beatle-inspired reissues, ranging from the limited edition US Assembled Revolution and 1965 models to the more recent Inspired by range made in Indonesia. Of course, 2021 saw the announcement that, for the first time in 50 years, there was to be a US-made casino, albeit with the earlier headstock shape, as you've seen on Paul McCartney's. So, why the casino? Now, the Beatles, at the time they were using the casino, were undeniably the biggest band in the world and arguably would have access to pretty much anything their heart desired, yet they consistently chose the casino. So why is that? Now, one answer lies in the fact that, thanks to it being an entirely hollow body design, it's incredibly lightweight and comfortable to play, especially for prolonged periods of time. And if you're gigging as heavily as the Beatles did in 1966, that would undeniably be very helpful. But personally, I believe the answer lies in, thanks to its hollow body design, just how loud and resonant the casino is unplugged. It's a songwriter's dream, and the amount of musicians who have leaned very heavily on the casino over the years, from Keith Richards to Ray and Dave Davis to Paul Weller, is very much testament to that. That said, you plug it in and you've got a gutsy, slightly unwieldy rock and roll machine that you need look no further than someone like Gary Clark Jr. for an absolute masterclass in how to tame it and how to really get the best out of an Epiphone casino. Thanks to its hollow body design and its twin P90s, it's arguably one of the most versatile electric guitars I've ever played, and it's amazing to see that just in time for its 60th birthday. Thanks to Get Back, it is experiencing this resurgence. It honestly is such an incredible design. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fretworks. Cheers, guys. Merry Christmas.